So I'd like to start this talk with an expression of gratitude. This preparation, this presentation would not have a home if not for the hard work and the vision of Dr. Daryl Taylor um, and his hard work in, in organizing this conference of the African American Art Song Alliance. I'd like to thank Dr. Taylor for his vision in willing this alliance into existence. It is a profoundly beautiful thing and I'm honored to be speaking with you today. Um, I also need to thank the heirs of composer Margaret Bonds for their kind permission to publish The Sea Ghost and I'd like to thank Hildegard Publishing Company for allowing me to use and display pre-publication uh, shots from their edition for purposes of this uh, presentation. Um, additionally, um, I need to thank soprano Zoe McCree and, pian uh, McCray and pianist Elizabeth Hill, both of whom are in Washington, D.C. I needed a recording of The Sea Ghost and of Margaret Bonds' earliest surviving song, for this presentation and they graciously agreed to record that for us. So you'll get to hear Margaret Bonds' very first song again. And uh, additionally, I'd uh, like to, so that's not what was supposed to happen. Uh, I did and it takes me to the next screen over here. But I, I need to be able to scroll down. Okay. Come look. And then I'm just going to cut to the next slide, everyone. So if I do this, you see it up here, but I need to be able to do that scroll bar. Okay. Um, let me try one thing. And if I use the arrow key, it. Yeah, that doesn't help. I'm going to use the HDMI. Because um, here I have it on the computer. Okay, so. Yeah, um, I don't know how to fix this. Um, because I really want to know how to work it, and it's hooked up to that channel. Okay. Um, Let's see. Oh, so I need to be able to use that scroll bar. Oh. Right. Slides with more text than it fits, and the mouse is up there, but not down here. Oh, uh, move the mouse over to the screen. What do you mean? Oops. It was over here, so there's two different screens up there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's back over there. There it is. Okay. So, uh, Without those several kindnesses, this presentation would be just so many words and sounds rattling around in my head. Right? I'm thankful to all of you for being here. So with that said, let's talk about Margaret Bonds, finally. Until recently, precious little has been known about Margaret Bonds' development as a composer. We all know that in 1932, at the age of 19, she commenced the long string of extraordinary songs by which she is still best known. But because Bonds' early music has traditionally been considered lost, uh, we do not know the story of her development as a composer. Did it occur gradually, or was it the result of a sudden breakthrough? By all appearances, the latter would be the case, but we all know that appearances can be deceiving. That's a problem because, as everybody here knows, we're talking about a truly extraordinary intellect and imagination, a pianist who by age 18 had mastered repertoire that is still daunting for pianists three times that age, and one of the greatest and most enduringly intrepid champions of racial justice that classical music has ever known. She was also a composer whose works would have been easily, almost automatically published had she been white and male, but whose more than 470 compositions have been consigned to mostly posthumous obscurity because of her race and her sex. So the stakes are high, far too high for us to settle for conjecture or speculation where her development as a composer is concerned. And we no longer have to settle for that. Recent research has brought to light no fewer than four early songs that add to the body of song that we have by Margaret Bonds and also shed new light on her development as a composer. The earliest of those songs is the 1928 political campaign song, We're All for Hoover Today, and the second is The Sea Ghost, which won the 1932 Rodman Wanamaker Prize and has often been described as lost. 
Those songs provide the essential, though previously unseen, context for the mature compositional voice of Margaret Bonds, which includes four more songs written between 1932 and 1934, two of those songs previously unknown. We'll return to that early outpouring of mature song a little bit later on. Let's begin, though, with the personal and professional context for that outpouring of song. Margaret Bonds was born in Chicago in 1913 to a mother, Estella Bonds, who was a pianist, organist, teacher, eventual founding member of the National Association of Negro Musicians, and longtime organist at Chicago's historic Berean Baptist Church, and a father, Monroe Alpheus Majors, who was a doctor so deeply involved in racial justice activities that he repeatedly had to move from one state to another in order to avoid the wrath of white hate groups. He's also the author of the book, Noted Negro Women, which was published in 1893. Margaret Bonds' parents divorced when she was four, and she was raised by her mother, also retaining her mother's surname and always revering her as one of the most important sources of inspiration in her life and her work. Although she would later recollect that as a child, quote, end quote, she studied with Florence Price and William Levy Dawson, she consistently singled out Abby Mitchell and Will Marion Cook as her most important early teachers, later recalling that Mitchell taught her, quote, the importance of the marriage between words and music which is demanded if one is to have a song of any consequence, end quote, and Cook, oops, uh, quote, invested her with the responsibility of sending Negro music around the world, end quote. Bonds was quickly recognized as a prodigy, and in 1928, a group of her school teachers, which went under the name of the STs, school teachers, get it, <laughs> hatched a plan to establish a fund that would enable her to uh, further her musical studies. With the aid of that fund and of scholarships from Alpha Kappa Alpha Incorporated and the Rosenwald Foundation, she attended Northwestern University beginning in 1929, there studying piano with Emily Bukerbog, and beginning in 1931, vocal composition with Carl Beecher and instrumental composition with Arne Oldberg. She received her bachelor's degree in 1933 and her master's degree in 1934. And shown here is the cover page and the respective page of the program from her master's commencement program, which also mentions her, uh, her, her bachelor's degree. Um, in the meantime, she had performed her friend and mentor Florence Price's first Fantasie Negra at the National Meeting of NAM in 1930 won first prize in the song category of the Wanamaker competition for the Sea Ghost in 1932, become the first African-American woman to feature as pianist with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in 1933, and performed Price's Concerto in One Movement with the Woman's Symphony Orchestra of Chicago at the Century of Progress World's Fair in 1934. At that point, she was all of 21 years old, and the compositional voice that we know as Margaret Bonds had been in manifest for two full years. So those few highlights uh, from Margaret Bonds' early career say much about her talent, her energy, her early abilities as a performer of others' works, but they still leave unanswered that question of her development as a composer. To get an idea of that development, we need to look at her earliest surviving composition, a political campaign song for Herbert Hoover, who won the 1928 presidential election titled, We're All for Hoover Today. This song was written and published uh, when Margaret Bonds was all of 15 years old, self-published by her. Its text is written by her father, Dr. Majors, and this song is the only known collaboration between him and her. Probably everybody here today wishes that Margaret Bonds' first musical act of political engagement had been on behalf of someone other than Herbert Hoover. <laughs> the engraver of the published score probably got it right with the verbal eye roll that we see in the footer. We're all for etc. <laughs> While it is initially puzzling that Bonds and her father endorsed an obvious racist, that unlikely endorsement probably was obtained because in the late 1920s, the tide of white on black violence showed no signs of abating in the U.S., and Hoover, strategizing to win the support of enfranchised northern blacks and sympathetic non-blacks, cunningly included an anti-lynching plank in his campaign platform, a plank he blithely ignored once he won the election. In any case, We're All for Hoover Today shows us that already at age 15, Margaret Bonds was a talented composer, a gifted melodist who also had a taste for active piano parts and harmonic adventure. That last trait is evident already in the conspicuously off-tonic beginning of the piece, 
as well as the subsequent periodic structure of this first strain and elsewhere, passages that employ surprisingly sophisticated harmonic language for a political campaign song by a 15-year-old. So let's listen to just the first strophe of We're All for Hoover today, performed by soprano Zoe McRae and pianist Elizabeth Hill. still a long way from the compositional voice that we know from the Margaret Bonds of the mid-1930s, and it clearly reflects the popular style of her teacher, Will Marion Cook. It's probably much better than most of us here could have written when we were 15 years old. It also demonstrates the remarkable store of talent and intellect that led Bonds's teacher to endorse her as a prodigy and that enabled her to enroll at Northwestern University in 1929, although as we will hear, Margaret Bonds' experiences at Northwestern were far from uniformly positive. While there, she would study vocal composition with the Dean of the Northwestern University School of Music, composer and pianist Carl Milton Beecher, and that study was important for her in several ways. Here's the page from the 1931-32 um, uh, Northwestern University Bulletin that shows the entries for the courses she took with Beecher. She took those courses in either the spring or the fall of 1931, and in 1932, she submitted the song The Sea Ghost, which was certainly written for those, to the Rodman Wanamaker contest. The awards were announced in a special ceremony held on 25th September, and for The Sea Ghost, Margaret Bonds won $250, which would be about $5,400 in 2022, a considerable sum. Her triumph was announced <coughs> in the university newspaper, oops, excuse me, the Daily Northwestern, and on September 29th, on September 29th, although that article, we have to say, is at least as much about Beecher and Northwestern as it is about Bonds. The article identifies Bonds as, quote, a Negro girl, end quote, and states that she had been awarded first prize in, quote, a contest restricted to Negro composers, end quote, noting that the praise she garnered for the song had is what had encouraged her to submit it to the competition, and adding that, quote, Miss Bond's specialty is piano, but she has developed a decided gift for composition, according to Dean Beecher, end quote. The text of The Sea Ghost was first published by Frank Dempster Sherman in The Century, an illustrated monthly magazine in 1892, and was widely reprinted and even anthologized. Sherman titled it, a Sea Ghost, not The Sea Ghost. Although Sherman today is regarded as a minor lyricist and author of children's verses, he was well regarded in the early 20th century. His poem, Springtime of Love, was set by Horatio Parker in 1905. His poem, Until, was set by Samuel Coleridge Taylor and published by him in, in 1908. And another poem, God's Miracle of May, was set by Arne Oldberg, who was another of Bonds' teachers at Northwestern in 1906. The text of the sea ghost reads, All night I heard along the coast the sea her grief outpour, and with the dawn arose a ghost to haunt the furrowed shore. And when from out the gray mist rolled the sun above the town, a shipwrecked sailor came and told of how the ship went down. Then did I sudden understand the sobbing of the sea, and of that white ghost on the sand I knew the mystery. 
Now, on its surface, this poem is a ghost story with all the sophistication of campfire stories or, for that matter, some of the movies my grandsons watch, or to be honest, some of the movies that I watch. Uh, but The Century was a magazine for adults, not children. And this is, is, after all, a poem, not children's verses. There's more to it than its surface. In the, uh, uh, in the first stanza, the unidentified, solitary lyric persona looks out on a furrowed shore haunted by a sea outpouring its grief. In the second, the coming light of day brings the ghost of a sailor whose tragic shipwrecked death that sorrowful sea bemoans. And in the third, the light of day is mirrored by the light of understanding as the protagonist recognizes the tragedy that befell the ghost with whom, it turns out, she stands on that same shore furrowed by sorrow. The ghost shares the space and the experience of the protagonist, and the protagonist's recognition of that shared tragedy is the telos of the poem. Given this, the sea ghost emerges as a tale of repressed memory, of a life taken and the belated realization in the light of understanding of the tragedies that unfold uh, from a story left untold. The Sorrowful Sea is a metaphor for the protagonist's troubled consciousness, the gray mists and breaking sunlight for memories, repression and retrieval, and the ghost for the protagonist's traumatized se former self. The poem is thus a parable for the tragedies that will remain ever unresolved if their memory is repressed. And the sea ghost, it turns out, is not a simple ghost story at all. 18-year-old Margaret Bonds ably translated this parable of haunted, sorrowing grief into music, and in so doing, revealed her familiarity with another well-known musical tale of haunted, sorrowing grief, the celebrated song Bel Ayaman from Franz Schubert's Winterreise. Both songs are in slow, temp slow, slow tempo, both begin pianissimo, both use a highly repetitive piano accompaniment composed of just a few melodic and motivic cells, and both feature an accented, sustained chord introduced by an appoggiatura on the raised fourth. There is also plenty of text painting in Bonds' song. For example, the appearance of the ghost is reflected by eerie chromatic harmonies in the accompaniment. The piano part features a turbulent, rumbling surge that might represent the cresting of the sea's waves or perhaps the gusts of sea wind. The coming of the light of dawn is mirrored by a turn from the initial A minor to F major. And as the ghost tells of the shipwreck that took its life, the vocal line descends and the piano part includes a chromatic descent, both gestures that portray the ship's descent into its watery grave. That said, there's a world of difference between the barren spaces of Bel Ayaman and the surging waves of unvoiced sorrow in The Sea Ghost. Bel Ayaman is a, is a tale of tragedy unchanged, while The Sea Ghost is a tale of tragedy revealed and recognized. That, too, did not escape the musical attention of 18-year-old Margaret Bonds. Bonds tonally acknowledges the, to the poem's division into three strophes. The first strophe begins and ends in A minor. The second strophe turns to a somewhat brighter F major as the day begins to break, but modulates back through D minor to the original A minor as the ghost tells its tragic tale. And the moment of recognition in the third strophe is symbolically represented in the reprise of the opening material in the original key in Bonds's setting. Throughout, the surges in the piano with the dissonant lowered ninth at their summit are sonorous metaphors for the persistent sorrow that rises and breaks in the present of the lyric persona. Now, tonight's program will include the first ever documented live performance of the Sea Ghost, given by soprano Nicole Jenkins and pianist Lorna Griffith, a historic live reveal of a song long considered lost. For now, in order to illustrate the points just made, let's listen to a video recorded performance made specifically for this talk by soprano Zoe McRae and pianist Elizabeth Hill.
in the comparison list were all for etc. today. Indeed, the sea ghost brings the originality that would become the signature of Margaret Bonds' mature musical voice a little bit closer to the surface. But that originality is still not there, and we have to wonder who or what the unseen force was that finally enabled it to emerge from the depths. For just look at what happens immediately after the sea ghost. It was immediately followed by an early version of her setting of Langston Hughes's Winter Moon, then by the setting of Joyce Kilmer's Sleep Song for Women's Voices and Piano and the solo version of that song. Those were followed by the setting of Hughes's Poem d'Automne, early versions of some of the songs on poems by Edna St. Vincent Millay and Robert Frost, and the early, now lost version of To a Brown Girl Dead, and the extraordinary and still unpublished but ravishingly beautiful, believe me, setting of Paul Lawrence Dunbar's Sunset, and of course her iconic setting of The Negro Speaks of Rivers, that last written in 1936 when Bonds was just 23. Now to sample that development would greatly exceed the limits of this paper but to give you a sense of the qualitative growth that takes place in this explosion of artistic creativity and song, let me ask you to compare the sea ghost, which we just heard, with this short excerpt from one of my favorite fruits from that flowering of mature song, the Poème d'Automne, which was premiered on April 15, 1934. This performance, by the way, is the one on Dr. Louise Toppin's wonderful album, Ah, Love But A Day. to the problem. The ghost that is the subject of the sea ghost is only one of several phantoms that are in play here. Of the other ones, arguably the most important, certainly the most pressing, is the one whose agency completed Margaret Bonds' musical maturation, the one that enabled her to grow ten, more, 10 years or more as a composer in the mere months that separated the sea ghost from the mature songs just sampled. Months. And that takes us back to the problem we posed. What happened? to effect such an enormous transformation in such a short time. With that question, I'm done sharing anything new from me in this talk because everyone here knows what happened, what the unseen but powerfully felt presence was that effected that transformation from the sea ghost to the poem d'Auton. It was Bonds' first encounter with the poetry of Langston Hughes. The beauty, courage, power, and wisdom of Hughes's poetic voice, the artistic and social kinship of spirit that Bonds shared with him, and the career-long friendship and collaboration that these two artists enjoyed collectively transformed her as an artist. Although she might have easily viewed her many achievements during those years surrounding the sea ghost as keys to her compositional maturation, she says little about them. Instead, she consistently singles out Langston Hughes and his poetry as the transformative force in her creative life. So let's use the last few minutes of this talk to listen to something old, to Margaret Bonds explaining in her own words how the phenomenon of Langston Hughes and his poetry saved her. Let's start with a familiar statement. This one is taken from an interview that Bonds gave to the noted historian of black theater, James Hatch, on December 28, 1971, about four and a half months before her death. This and the following excerpts are read for us by Dr. Candace Johnson, whose brilliant one-woman Margaret Bonds show we saw this afternoon. And I should tell you that, uh, that Dr. Johnson actually studied the audio of the, of the interview that Bonds made with James Hatch, and she emulates Bonds' style of delivery, her wonderful Midwestern accent, and, uh, and other aspects of her personality uh, in this quote. It's, she sounds very much like I think you would hear Margaret Bonds sound if she were communicating with us today. So here's the first of those uh, excerpts. Public Library. I met Langston, uh, his work. I was at the Evanston Public Library, you know. If I had, here you are, 
we're going to set up. We're Bristol on stay on Stern to me. You're going to college. You, you're sacrificing, trying to get through school. And uh, I know that that poem helped save me, you know. So then about a year later, I said it for Marian Anderson. And she never sang it. <laughs> she never sang it. Yeah. She knew I did it for her, and she said that, now this is a crazy thing. She said that it was too difficult. <laughs> that last verse, both of those last words are miraculously accurate replications of Margaret Barnes in that interview. Time to flip side. Yes, so... Uh, Bond spoke in more detail and with greater candor about her first encounter with Hughes's poetry in a letter that she wrote to her daughter, Dionne Richardson, around 1969. Here she further explains how her initial encounter with The Negro Speaks of Rivers instilled in her a sense of pride in her African and African American heritage, then referring to the racist depredations she had endured at the supposedly integrated Northwestern University. She states that she had set Hughes's poem to music in order to instill in black folk feelings of pride, of superiority, rather than inferiority. When I was younger than you are now, I read this poem in the basement of the Emerson Public Library. I found my identity through Uncle Langston's great poem. It set the poem to music in order to inspire black people when it didn't designate them as black in those days. But I wanted to inspire them with courage, pride, feelings of superiority rather than inferiority. The third and final quote is the one that most explicitly connects the salvation that Langston Hughes's poetry brought to Margaret Bonds with the racist environment to which she was, she was subjected at Northwestern flatly refuting the daily Northwestern self-serving portrayal of the white benevolence of Bonds' education, the composer here describes Evanston as a city controlled by white Southerners and derides the university as a, quote, cesspool of white supremacy, bigotry, and prejudice, end quote. Finally, she explains the nature of her salvation, stating outright that Hughes, quote, wrote a truth that cannot be denied, end quote when he countermanded refusals in restaurants and suspicious glances from shopkeepers by reminding black people that black is beautiful. And who are part of my ancestry say, if a man doesn't know from whence he came, he can't possibly know where he's going. My mother's mother, Margaret Ann Bonds from babyhood taught me to be proud of my African ancestry. Every time an African came to lecture in Chicago where I was born, Margaret Ann bundled me up and took me. She brainwashed me with the idea that Africans are superior people, that African dyes never fade, that African men can grow bolts in the face of forceful waves, that Africans could weave cloth that outlast the cloth of any other people in the world, that Africans' rhythmic sense is far superior to any other peoples of the world, that Africans could swim turbulent rivers and survive because of their virility. Having convinced me of my superiority because of my having African blood, at age 16, Margaret Ann forced me to rise at 5 in the morning to travel 17 miles from Chicago to Evanston to attend that cesspool of white supremacy, bigotry, prejudice, known as Northwestern University. Colored girls weren't even allowed to swim in the swimming pool. Their black might rub off. However, she boasted to friends, Margaret is going to NU. And after refusals and restaurants, suspicious glances from shopkeepers and various affronteries and other in insults to the quote American way of life, I discovered Langston Hughes in the basement of the Evanston Public Library. My landlady, a caterer, explained that Evanston was controlled by thousands of Southerners. Mrs. Cromer, her name was, catered a luncheon periodically for a club to which 5,000 Southern women comprised the membership. The Negro Speaks of Rivers was my introduction to Langston Hughes.
His great poem corroborated everything Nima had told me about my people. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. During my sophomore year at a major American university, I discovered a poet who wrote a truth that cannot be denied. Now in my mature years, I know why little black people all over our land revere Langston Hughes. Before Martin Luther King Jr. and later black militancy, Langston Hughes constantly reminds us that we are an important entity in the world population that we need have no feelings of inferiority, that we are black and beautiful. And so we see it, the final unseen but also oh powerfully felt presence that produced Margaret Bonds' compositional breakthrough in that remarkably short span of time was not a genteel education at a benevolent white university, far from it. On the contrary, that breakthrough was the result of black self-affirmation. It was born in the crucible of bigotry, prejudice, hardship, and sorrow that she endured at Northwestern as an African-American woman, but it was not born of that crucible. It was born of something altogether different, for under, in that segregated library basement during her sophomore year, a voice rose from the pages of the crisis to meet Margaret Bond, just like the voice that, from the, the seaghost, right? To meet her and by her own account, save her. The phantom presence that transported her and transformed her from a talented but still academic composer into the remarkable phenomenon we celebrate tonight. It was the poetic voice of Langston Hughes. And with that, I thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry for the technological difficulties which seem to be built into our existence, but uh, thank you for being here.